early into the project, not knowing how difficult it is to do anything about Broadway because of the union control of any filming and the limitations and the cost of doing anything because of all the unions involved with the performances and the access to the theaters is very controlled. And I never would have done it if I hadn't been invited by a real Broadway insider who got me excited about the idea of this film and told me about it. And it was a surprising source. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, woman named Pat Schoenfeld, who's the widow of Jerry Schoenfeld, who appears in the documentary, who for a long time was the chairman who ran the Schubert organization, which is the owners of the, of the most, of the biggest theater owner in Broadway. They own about 14 or 15 of Broadway's 40 theaters. And uh, I met Pat at a New Year's Day party um, about five years ago. And we, we, a friend introduced us and she said, I want you to read a book that my husband wrote that I pud, published posthumously, which is his story of his career on Broadway. And I think it would make a wonderful documentary. And I said, well, I'd love to read the book and I'm a you know, lifetime New Yorker and I love the theater. And so it sounds fun. So I read the book and I realized it was a wonderful insider's view of, of what Broadway had been for the last 50 years, basically. Um, but unfortunately, Jerry is no longer alive. And I told her, Pat, I'd love to do a film about Jerry, but we can't because he's not here. This, this is you know, something he wrote. He didn't do interviews. We don't have the material to sort of tell this story. But there's a wonderful story that's inside his memoir, which is the story of Broadway's amazing comeback. How something that I didn't really understand how close Broadway came when I was you know, really young in the, in, the, right. in the 70s, it almost went out of business. I mean, it literally was on the verge of, there were, there were conversations uh, of you know, the highest levels in New York. The, you know, the, the DA of New York wanted when there was a, a, a sort of a scandal about corruption and the tickets in Broadway in the, in the 60s, wanted to literally shut down Broadway and demolish all the theaters and turning them into parking lots. That's how close it came I to. I had no idea about all of that until I watched your film. <laughs> and so the story of how it bit by bit, it came back and it built its audience and it changed. And certain things you know, that people loved about the old Broadway maybe have been lost, but so much more has been gained that there's something that I really had to admire and was excited about the idea of telling more people about it and just learning how it worked and what had happened. And again, thanks to Pat Schoenfeld and then through her, um, a few other you know, really helpful people. We were able to recruit the wonderful cast of actors and directors and, pro and producers and uh, others who, who appear in the film who tell their sort of story of how they experienced these changes. So um, I wanna know a little bit about you and how, what are you, have you been involved with Broadway? You said when we were talking before, you had said that you were here in Chicago um, preparing for a show down by UIC. So are you an actor besides for being a director? I know you've done many other documentaries as well. Um, I have had a, a sort of very brief intermittent career as a theater director and then a playwright. Um, I studied directing, um, went to graduate school for theater directing after I'd started my film career. And then I did, I worked for a couple of years in the, in the regional theater in, uh, in, te in theaters in Texas and in Rhode Island and a little bit off off Broadway in New York and then picked up my film career again and went back more to more to film and then a few years ago I adapted a novel um, to be a play that was produced first in Chicago at the Court Theater and then in several other regional theaters around the country and in, in Washington and Boston and a few other places um, but my real career has been as a documentary filmmaker I was just about to ask, I was like, and which one do you prefer? If you could be Broadway, <laughs> would well, you prefer I mean, or? Uh, they're both really, really fun. I mean, the, the temptation with, with Broadway is the excitement of working with actors, working with talented actors and designers. And if you're, you know, the director with the, with the you know, working with wonderful playwrights, um, uh, you know, that collaboration is a very intimate, personal, warm, you know, focused thing of energy where you're with this sort of, in COVID, we're all beginning to understand more of this because we have these pods and we're with those right. small groups. But to be with a small group and collaborating over, a, you know, sometimes it's only four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, whatever it is, 
putting together and then suddenly you create something. That's a very exciting process. And, you know, there's a similar process with working with your, your team when you're making a documentary. But in, in documentaries, the excitement is really engaging with something new that's happening and being part of entering a world that you may not know anything about. I mean, I happen to know a little bit about Broadway from right. going to Broadway plays all my life and knew about the theater from working as a director and a playwright. But I, you know, to enter that whole quite hermetic world of, of, of theater at that level of the Broadway producers world and the, the behind the scenes was an exciting sort of discovery as a filmmaker. So is that why you wanted to, you chose to include uh, behind the scenes of preparing for the movie for the NAP, for the Broadway film, the NAP, the Broadway play, the well, NAP. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, we thought, you know, we were telling a historical story. We were telling about how Broadway had changed. And I thought for audiences today, people, you know, are interested in history, but they really want to know what's the sort of relevance to what's going on today. And I also thought it would be exciting for people to have that access to be in a Broadway rehearsal room, which you hardly ever get to see. Right. And this was an unusual play in a number of ways. When we started the film, it was very interesting. Broadway had had a stretch of seasons about five or six years where there, each year there'd been fewer and fewer plays as opposed to musicals on Broadway. There's always been a kind of a balance where Broadway thinks, well, we get musicals in, in the bigger theaters. The, the Broadway houses are different sizes. Um, right. And the bigger ones are more suited for musicals because there's more space backstage for the sets and the and the, the costume changes and getting things on and off the stage. And in the smaller theaters, it's more just for a smaller cast where it's just a play and you're talking and there's not as much about the spectacle. Um, but in recent years, there'd been fewer and fewer plays because musicals make more money and it was harder to get audiences, particularly the tourists who came from other countries who may not speak English. It was much easier to get them to go to a show like Phantom of the Opera where they'd heard of it and they knew the songs and they could go and they don't have to understand the English. Um, and so we were really worried and a lot of the people we interviewed when we were making the film thought plays on Broadway are really in danger. And so we wanted to show that Broadway was still willing to take a chance and do that there were, were venues on Broadway where you could do a play, which in the old parlance they called straight plays, meaning that there was no music. Um, okay. Not referring to the sexuality, just referring right. to the, it was music, no music, it was a straight play. Um, and so we picked one that was a new play. There weren't going to be many new, new plays produced that season. And we wanted to show one that was actually in a non-commercial theater, because that's the, one of the other big changes of Broadway in recent years that we show a little bit about in the film, although we don't explain it in too much detail because it's kind of technical. But, <laughs> I mean, chorus. We sail, tell the story of chorus line was the beginning of this of this total revolution in the way Broadway plays were produced. In that there was this non-commercial, non-profit theater world, which where you don't have to make a profit. You're supported by philanthropic gifts and by government subsidies and by other breaks that allow you to do more risky, non-commercial work. Right. And then the best of that work gets discovered and moved to Broadway. Um, over the past twenty years or so. The best of those or the biggest of those nonprofit theaters have bought Broadway houses. So they have their own real estate on Broadway where they can do these nonprofit plays, but draw a Broadway audience to see them. And we wanted to celebrate that that's part of this ecosystem of Broadway. You right. have the big musicals, you have the star studded ventures, and then you have these more cutting edge kind of plays. And we wanted to show an example of that. And then we got the other sort of surprise break that the NAP featured in the first season this has ever occurred on Broadway, a trans actor playing a trans role. Um, and uh, with the wonderful uh, trans actress, uh, Alexandra Billings was playing one of the leads in the NAP. And so we were excited to have access to that production to show behind the scenes and to meet her. It was a great part of the film to see that, like as a someone who's never seen behind the scenes, I think it was a great part. Um, was there anything that you learned along the way that you never knew from your interviews? That, that's a great question. I mean, there, there are a couple of things that really surprised me. Um, I mean, the first thing is the whole arc that we explained earlier about how Broadway almost went out of business. And right? yes. I had a vague sense, but I didn't know how dire it got. And I didn't know how big the change had been in the, in the terms of the comeback. That the year that we filmed, 
do you think that 1972 is when our story kind of starts, um, right. when the when uh, Jerry Schoenfeld took over the Schubert organization, um, and it ended in in uh, 2018, the 2018-19 season. That was the most successful commercially season that Broadway ever had. More people saw Broadway shows. They made more money. It was the biggest boom year they've in the history of Broadway. Um, so we were we got it kind of at the apex, and especially right. if you think about now, the the next season, which is the season that's that just ended, right. um, basically was you know nothing. It stopped, and we don't know when Broadway will come back. Um, you know, it closed on March thirteenth, yeah. and um, there's no real sign in sight of how they're going to reopen or when they're going to reopen. They're hoping they've announced some shows for fall of next year, which I guess if we get a vaccine, then hopefully we'll be back and people will be able to sit in theaters again. Um, so we had a few questions actually about that. Um, okay. What do you think will happen to Broadway post COVID? And do you think will Broadway will come back the way it used to be after the pandemic? And to add to that, what are theater owners and actors doing currently? Are they preparing? Are they still able to practice? I mean, there, the first two questions, it's really, really hard for me to say, and I can't, you know, anything I would predict or hope for would be just a, a whim or a dream. Um, I think Broadway is really resilient. I mean, that's one of the things oh, if you yeah. see this film, you'll understand is that Broadway is all about adapting to different times and figuring out what it needs to do to, to succeed and get by and draw audiences. And I think that, you know, people will start in this country. I think, you know, we can only pray that people will start to take this pandemic more seriously and take the precautions they need to stop it. And it's, it's gonna be really about the will of the people. If people will follow you know, the steps, and I'm sure we'll be getting more steps in the months ahead, we'll be getting more contact tracing. I know there's now, I don't know about Chicago and New York City, we now have an app, or maybe it's New York State, there's an app you can get where you have to put in the information of you know, who you are and where you are, and if you've had testing or what you're, you know, whether you've had COVID or not, and it's a way of tracing everybody and making sure if everybody will cooperate, then we'll know and people. And if we get a vaccine and it's and it's distributed to everybody and everybody takes it, I think we can be back in theaters within, I think Dr. Fauci was predicting life could go back to normal by the third quarter, which is like July of, of this coming year. Uh -oh. wow. So we can just pray that happens. I mean, but the Broadway, Broadway community, <laughs> the Broadway community, we actually, I, I, uh, just finished last month. We did a follow-up film to On Broadway. Oh, you did. On the New Yorker. It's on the New Yorker website. You people can check it out if you look for COVID and Broadway and the New Yorker. There's a little video called "Give My Regards to Broadway," which I did about Broadway and COVID, and uh -huh. it shows how the community is coming together. I mean, the amazing things that organizations like the Actors Fund have done to help. You know, basically think of a whole industry which employs thousands of people, and everyone just their income stopped on March 13th. Right. No, you know, no shows, no audience, no money. And so some of the worst case cases have been supported by the Actors Fund, which I think when we finished the video had given out about $20 million. And that was a month or so ago. So it's probably wow. gotten even more that they've supported wow. from their, you know, the philanthropic gifts they get, they give these donations, they get donations and, and support people. Um, and then the community of Broadway performers themselves we show many got together and did fabulous things like there's a there's a group that called broadway feeds bellevue which is the big one of the biggest hospitals in the city and they basically have a fund where they collected from actors and stagehands and other people in the theater gave money so that the emergency room in bellevue would be able to have dinner every night they got a, a, a dinner delivered uh, wow. by broadway feeds bellevue um, so they're kind of rallying around trying to support others, even though they're going through a tough time themselves. So from the pandemic, I know that a few um, Broadway, like Hamilton went to streaming and West Wing did a play of their, um, one of their episodes. Do you think that is helping Broadway right now? Do you think more people will want to start streaming their plays? I mean, there's definitely a lot of streaming going on. Um, it seems that it's more from nonprofit theaters are doing it. You know, some of the of the some of the we've been talking about the the non-commercial theaters have are set up to do things like that. Uh -huh. um, but a few of the, you know, 
Broadway understands they have to keep reminding their audience that Broadway's there and keep that audience fed so that they'll wanna come back and when the pandemic's over. So I know that as part of the Thanksgiving day celebrations uh, on Thursday, several Broadway shows are broadcasting, if not the whole play, at least big chunks of their shows. So Ain't Too Proud to Beg, the wonderful musical about the Temptations, they're doing a presentation, Jagged Little Pill, which was one of the shows, the musicals this year that got nominated for a lot of Tonys, they'll be showing some of their numbers. And I think that reminds people and keeps them engaged. But there's a lot of stuff online. If you look around, the National Theater from Britain has been uh, streaming some of their best productions and they have a great collection going back, you know, 10 years or more of stuff that they've done. So speaking of Britain, I also learned about how a lot of the plays that you bring to the US originally showed in London. It, was that like the test run? And if it goes well in London, then we'll bring it to the US? That's definitely, you know, one of the things they figured out that we show in the film in the 1980s, it really began. I mean, it all it always been a tradition of the great English actors coming to America in the best reviewed, most popular British plays. So, you know, Laurence Olivier acted on a play in London and then when he was in his twenties or thirties, he came and had his Broadway debut in the same play. Um, so there was sort of a tradition of that, but it really intensified in the seventies when Broadway was struggling and they were desperate for product. And they knew that there was a certain both appetite for things that were British and there was a kind of a snobbery. If you had a play with an English accent, people sort of thought it was better, you know, maybe it was more cultural than if they just saw an American play. Um, but there was a great stream. It also happened to coincide with a wonderful fertile period of British playwrights and actors. So play, you know, writers like Harold Pinter and Tom Stoppard and David Story were doing their first plays and, uh, or, you know, doing a number of plays over that decade. And some of the great stars that you know now became movie stars, um, you know, starting with Richard Burton and going all the way, you know, Patrick Stewart, uh, uh, you know, Ma Maggie Smith, all of these wonderful British actors came in to Broadway. Um, so it was a it was an important part of the, as I say, the ecosystem that helped keep Broadway vital and kept people wanting to come. So uh, Stu Susan has a question. She wanted to know. Uh, did Brett, did Bette Midler have a lot to do with improving 42nd Street years ago? Um, she, uh, Susan actually was born and raised in Manhattan and she remembers the days that you couldn't walk down that street after dark. Um, well, that, I mean, that's really interesting. I know that, you know, Bette was part of the New York scene back in the day when, when 42nd Street was really struggling, when, you know, things were, were tough. But she was, in those days, she was a, um, she was in, early in her career, she was a Broadway actress. She was in Fiddler on the Roof, I think in the original production, but uh, due to kind of, you know, bad sort of snobbish and sort of sexist views about women, people told her, oh, well, you don't have the looks to be a Broadway star, I think is what Jerry Robbins, who directed Fiddler on the Roof, told her. And so she figured out after doing that role, she didn't think she was going to make it on Broadway. So she became a cabaret singer and had this amazing wow. career where she sang in New York, there was a, a hotel, there's a, there used to be a hotel on uptown on Broadway in the Upper West Side on 73rd Street, I mean on, uh, uh, yeah, 73rd Street and Broadway called the Ansonia Hotel. And there was a famous gay club called the Continental Baths that was in the basement. There was a huge space in the basement of this hotel that was a, a, attracted gay audiences from all over the city. And, she was the star performer there and she got a following and became this sort of underground cult figure and went on from there to be a movie star. Now, whether she supported, you know, some of the efforts, I know she's done a lot of other very important civic work in the city where she supports parks. She's built a number of parks in Harlem and other poor neighborhoods in the city. And she's a really great New Yorker, New York citizen. Um, although she's originally from Hawaii, oh. but, uh, I don't know particularly about her involvement with 42nd Street, but there may have been one that we just didn't learn about. Uh, you know, the story of Broadway going from, you know, rebuilding and 42nd Street, and then also just seeing how it really is following along what's happening in the US and what's happening in the world, how they promote, you know, LGBTQ awareness and when AIDS, focusing on AIDS, that was really interesting to learn about also from the film. 
Well, again, you, you asked me what I learned. This was one of the big surprises and discoveries that I had making on Broadway was I was always kind of a snob and thought, well, Broadway succeeds by doing the most commercial work and the biggest successes are these plays that appeal to the lowest common denominator and they figure out what's popular and they appeal to those tastes and that's why those things are big hits. But I really discovered that it was the opposite and that Broadway, if you we trace in the film some of the biggest, the, the big sort of turning points in Broadway that changed the direction that Broadway shows went in and the musicals particularly that had a huge impact or the plays that had a huge impact. And if you look at all of those points of, of booths where the, it got more popular and it changed, it always happened when they, producers and theater owners were willing to invest in artists who took risks. And they were willing to do things that responded to something that was going on in our society at that moment. It was exciting and different. And it was sometimes about being racially aware and exposing people to stories from backgrounds and, and, and parts of the culture and ethnicities and races that they didn't know about. Sometimes it was about sexual orientation and exposing people to the stories of gay people or LGBTQ to you know, other, other groups and celebrating that and letting those people from artists who, with those backgrounds come and do their work on Broadway. And many of those works became the most successful works. And whether it's you know, Hamilton in recent right. years or Chorus Line uh, 40 years ago. Um, and that, you know, while Broadway isn't perfect in terms of representing the racial and other diversities of our society, it in many ways does reflect that. And the most vital, one of the biggest changes is how it's become more reflective and more like what our, our real world is like. And that you can't go see a Broadway musical now, which doesn't have a diverse cast. Right. And people are cast, you know, as somebody said, you know, the, the recent revival of Carousel, which is about, you know, a community of fishermen in Maine in the, I forget what time, you know, early 20th or late 19th century. And they have a lot of African-American and Latino members dancing around as if they were fishermen. People say, well, look, it's make-believe anyway. It's a, it's a, it's a musical, of, it's not a documentary film about Maine, it's a musical about Maine. And so you don't have to have that literal slavish thing of casting people who look like what they might have looked like at that time and place. And that's opened up Broadway a lot. Wow. Um, what is your favorite Broadway musical or Broadway play? <laughs> oh, that's that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> I mean, my, my taste of the musicals tend to run to the very old fashioned ones. I love the revivals. I mean, there was an amazing revival last season um, of Kiss Me Kate. Uh, um, and uh, with Kelly O'Hara, who's one of the great Broadway performers of this generation. Um, and a lot of people are looking forward next season, the big show that people are hoping will be herald the comeback of Broadway is they're doing The Music Man with Hugh Jackman um, and oh, Sutton wow. Foster, um, which will be, you know, is a wonderful, real American, sort of Americana, but fun musical that Hugh Jackman, I'm sure, will be amazing in. And, and you have Hugh Jackman, so it'll be amazing. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the real treats of doing this film, obviously, was getting to interview people like Hugh Jackman and Helen Mirren and Ian uh, McKellen and, uh, you know, some of the other great performers that we would get to talk to. There was, there was like, a, you had a wide range of Broadway members that you were able to interview, and some of them I had no idea that they had ever been in a Broadway film, you know, like John Lithgow, I never knew. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I mean, I saw John Lithgow, I think in his Broadway debut when I was, you know, a kid, he was he was in a show that he was working in a play at a regional theater that came to Broadway that was an English play um, by David Story. And that was, you know, and he stayed on Broadway, although he's, you know, been a huge star right. for, you know, 30 years, he keeps coming back and doing shows on Broadway whenever he can. And he's actually a, one of the main features of our COVID uh, documentary. So oh. I encourage people to go watch that because he's terrific in that. I'm looking forward to watching that. Um, I was incredibly surprised to learn about the eight and a half hour play. I must know more. <laughs> How did people sit for eight and a half hours? <laughs> well, I mean, that's, a, that's become kind of a tradition on Broadway. I mean, the big hit, again, the biggest, commercial success the year we were filming was the new Harry Potter play. Right. Um, which will probably reopen and go for years and years and years once Broadway comes back. Yes. And that's the same idea. It's two, four, you know, three hour or four hour plays 
that, uh, you know, you go see the first part and then you go have lunch and then you come back and you see the second part or you, or you see one on Wednesday night and you come back and see part two on Thursday night. Um, so it started with Nicholas Nickleby, which was a Charles right. Dickens novel, where they literally, the way they made the play was they sat around a table with the Dickens novel in their hands and they just took turns reading the lines. And then Peter Hall, the genius director of that period was able to craft that into something that became this very sort of, uh, you know, a lot of spectacle and stage magic things going on that created the world of Dickens for people and Broadway audiences loved it as audiences in London. That was another one that had been a hit in London. Right. And it was based on that, that they brought it to New York. And they made it, you know, it was kind of a thing where they made it like it's the cool thing to do. Like if you were somebody, anybody who really loved the theater, you had to go see this. And it was the first time, I mean, if you think about ticket prices on Broadway, that's one of the other biggest changes. I'd forgotten, because I was a kid, how cheap Broadway used to be. I mean, as, as uh, one of our interviews, uh, interviewees says, in the 1970s, the top ticket price, the, the very top, the most expensive seat you could get in the front of the orchestra was $10. Or maybe it was $9.99. Right. It was $9.99. Now you can pay a th over $1,000. When Bruce Springsteen's show was on, people were selling the tickets for $1,000, $1,500. And what are now used to be scalpers would sell them. Now their authorized ticket agencies are selling the tickets for that right. price. Um, but... Uh, yeah. How that. do you think uh, prices will change after COVID? Do you think they'll stay the same? They'll go up, they'll drop? I mean, some people are hoping that they'll go down. Right. That they'll figure out a way to, you know, that they'll need to, to make Broadway appealing to, a, a, you know, more and more Americans, figure out ways to economize and bring some of the costs down. I mean, they already have, this is one of the features that people don't always talk about. Although the top prices are very expensive, there are programs lots of places online where you can go and you know all the tickets to to Phantom of the Opera sell out because tourists from all over the world have heard of Phantom of the Opera and they right, want to go see right. it and it's been running for 40 years or 41 years now I guess or until COVID um, uh, but other shows never sell out so there are always extra seats left over and now there are ticket agencies which will sell those for half price instead of marking up the tickets they right. cut the price of the ticket so you can buy them for a fraction of what the, the face value is. Um, let's I think see. we'll see more of that after COVID. Um, so now I want to know about what projects you have coming up. Oh, well, it's a little early to say we're, we're working on a, on a, I think, a very exciting story about climate change and about a huge disinformation campaign that was waged by a big American corporation to hide the facts from the world, from America and the world about, about climate change. Oh, this wow. company knew back in the 1970s what was going to happen down to the tenth of a degree wow. of temperature and down to the sort of micro particle of, of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, how, how fast global warming was, was coming. And they basically paid scientists to lie about it. And when people say there are people who say, well, climate science, you know, there's disputes about whether it's really true and it's really caused by mankind. The only disputes are because of disinformation that was paid for by th these companies. Um, and so we're hoping to do a film which will expose that and show the efforts that are happening now to hold them accountable. So you enjoy doing documentaries, making documentaries? Uh, I enjoy, I'm not sure I always enjoy it. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, I can't resist it. I think there's more of what happens is you, you know, it's, I'm, I'm very lucky that, uh, you know, somehow I fell into this kind of work. And uh, once you get started, you, you kind of, it's hard to, it's hard to stop. Once and, you get a little uh, bit of information, you need to know more. And then you want to tell everybody about it. Exactly. You find out about things. People come to you with wonderful stories. Like Pat Schoenfeld came to me with this story and said, there's a great story here to be told. And then, you know, as you work longer and you make more films, I think you understand more about the ways to try to make those stories that are, you know, might work in a book, what you need to do to make it different to work as a film. And that's the, that's right. the challenge. That's the challenge. Um, is there anything else that you wanna leave with our um, on attendees today that you wanna, do you wanna tell them about from making the film or? Um, 
I guess I want to encourage people to support live theater. I mean, I know Chicago is maybe the, the best theater supporting city in America. I mean, people think of, of theater, you know, commercial theater, and they think of New York and they think of Broadway, but I don't think you have a, a dedicated theater audiences in New York the way you have in Chicago who support all of the wonderful theater companies that are in Chicago, the wonderful community of actors that are there. And I think it's really important that we do everything we can. I mean, people think of the arts as something that's like an extra or it's like a luxury. And people don't understand that arts are the lifeblood of a culture. They're, what, they're, what, they're the juice that sort of makes everything else work. The economy in New York, I mean, we don't go into it in great detail, but we said, you know, we, I mentioned earlier that it was the best season ever on Broadway. 15 million people saw a Broadway show and nearly $3 billion were spent on Broadway theater tickets. But many, many more billions were spent by the people who came to see those shows that keep the New York economy going. And I'm sure it's true in Chicago. It's like right. without all the wonderful theaters in Chicago, without the Art Institute, without people going out and supporting the arts, our cities would be dead and people wouldn't come to them. I mean, people would go to work, but the cities wouldn't know how to how to survive. I don't think as 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 fun, flourishing places without the arts. So I just encourage everybody. Thank you for seeing the film. Now I hope when you get it, your first chance, when things get better after you know COVID is in abeyance, go see a show in Chicago. And if you can, come see one in Broadway when they start up again. Yeah, I also liked when you were talking about that how they um, use Broadway for the I Love New York promotions and advertising. That also, I, I learned a lot from your film. <laughs> well, Broadway, I mean, people are really realizing now you walk downtown and Times Square, which, you know, before COVID would always have hundreds of thousands of people going through it every day. I mean, it, people said uh, Times Square was the most visited place on the planet. Right. Um, when we were making the film. And now it's literally empty. You I go down it. there and there may be a hundred people in the whole huge, you know, 10 square block area. Um, and uh, New York needs it to come back. So right. please do support the theater, but support it where you are too, because everywhere it's important. Agreed, agreed. Orin, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it was a pleasure. Talking to us about behind the scenes and the making of On Broadway. I personally learned a lot from it and I really enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> So thanks you too, Debra. They're great questions. And thanks oh, thank again, you. everybody, for, for being here and joining us today. And uh, tell your friends about it. And hopefully, uh, there'll be a, more opportunities to see the film. Yes. And this was actually rounding out. This was our final talk back as part of our Jewish virtual film festival. But we will be having another one in January with some social justice films. So please check our website at jccchicago.org to see what other films we have upcoming. So good luck in January. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Oren. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. You and thank too. you everyone for spending your Sunday with us. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.